Check out monorail.com, America's affordable investment app made for conservatives who want to keep their hard-earned money with companies that share their value. Download the Monorail app today. Join Monorail. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Dennis Prager Show. Headline, Daily Mail, revealed corrupt file and system reboot cause all U.S. flights to be grounded for first time since 9-11. NOTAM system and backup were both infected with corrupt file as pilots slam ridiculous decision to ground planes. I, uh, I marvel at the fact that a man of as little wisdom and competence as Mr. Buttigieg is the Secretary of Transportation, is that the title? He's in charge of this. Do you know what he did? The only thing that I know that he actually accomplished, he changed the original name of NOTAM. Did you know that? No. Oh, you'll love this. But, I, but there is one key line in that piece, why, well, why they did what they did. Yes, there is a key line in the piece for why they did what they did. An abundance of, what was the word? Caution. Caution. An abundance of caution. That is correct. Afraid of life and a pursuit of per- perfect safety is are, are characteristics that are among the most important in understanding the left. That's correct. They are afraid of life. They're not just afraid of death. They're afraid of life. That's why there are safe spaces at colleges, because they're afraid to have on campus someone with whom they differ. That's all it takes to retreat, to build a safe space. The words that are deemed non-safe, like Stanford's list, which they've retracted because even liberals found it distasteful but liberals will continue to adulate Stanford and, of course, work their hardest to get their kids into Stanford and vote Democrat. That's another subject. Apparently, according to pilots, there was absolutely no reason to close down every single flight in the United States and having a replay of Southwest, though not for days, for hours, but that costs a day for many people, obviously. And this, however, was not Southwest. This was every single airplane, commercial airplane in the United States of America. So I want to tell you the thing that he did, the one accomplishment. Uh, let's see, it Is was... A word, accomplishment? Well, yes, he, he, accom- he it, it's, a, it's absurd, but it is an accomplishment. I'm going to look up the word here. I think... Yes. No. Uh, that was not it. Well, it was originally, what it, NOTAM stands for, let's get that correct here. The Notice to Air Missions. That's what it stands for. And he changed the name because... He didn't like the original name. The original name, okay, I'll find it for you. Because this is, it's priceless. And I'm coming to it, God willing. Well, I I shouldn't invoke God. (laughs) Hyundai versus the other guys. Look what Hyundai has, and what Honda, what? Nissan, heck, heck. and Subaru don't. Hyundai oh, that's my laptop. No wonder. That's funny. I'm looking at you, Sean. Because my okay. view is... Uh, uh, that's true. I just... Ow, ow, ow. Ow, ow, ow. ow, ow. Okay. Anyway, it was originally something like a uh, notice to air... Airmen and... Uh, and now it's notice to air missions. He ch- he dropped airmen. Did you know that? Yeah. 
Yeah, it's it's in the article somewhere. This this is what he he can't keep airplanes up, but he uh, he was very assiduous about changing the name because their the name Airmen was in, was in there. I believe that w- that was the thing that troubled him because it had the word man or men. This is this is what uh, troubles them. Anyway, pilots have said that there was absolutely no reason to ground all airplanes. Pilots were capable of uh, ascertaining uh, the uh, the safety uh, and other matters regarding any given route, as they had for so many years prior to uh, prior to the uh, digital era. What is concerning to me, and I have not seen it emphasized, and I'm wondering if you, you've thought about this, it happened in Canada too, and I don't, they're not uh, on the same, whatever it would be called, on the same program, on the same site. Did you know that, that it happened in Canada? Mm. You know what, you know what's interesting? Canada did not ground its flights. Mm. Mm. The United States today, uh, under the Democrats, is, uh, is among the worst led countries on earth, of, of all, let's put it this way, of all industrialized democracies. I, I, I would argue that Zimbabwe is more poorly led. But y- you have to go to the third world to find such a place. These people are incompetent. Their incompetence is only matched by their... By... By their abundance of caution. Well, by that's true, their abundance of caution. But it's matched by the venality of their values. It's not just that they have awful values like drag queen story hour and removing girls' healthy breasts because they say they're boys. It's not just that. It's that they're incompetent. This is a scandal that that America grounded all its flights for the first time since 9/11. Can you imagine the disruption that caused? The disruption is beyond belief, and, you, and well, it's being felt now. You fly all, uh, yeah, yeah, no, I'm flying day. today. Yeah, so I'm, I, I just missed it. What would the what would day, I do? I don't. The whole day would have been. Not only would the whole day have been lost, but I could not have gotten to what I need to go to. Right, so you might have, uh, whole, uh, the whole event uh, might have uh, been. Uh, that's right. Uh, that's right. The chaos that is caused in people's lives by grounding all flights, what Southwest did. Incidentally, I did ask when it happened to Southwest, hundreds of thousands of people, and uh, what, tens of thousands of flights? I don't, I don't recall. A few thousand. A few thousand? No, I think it was more. A 7,000 flights? I th- I take a look. I, it, was a, it was a ridiculously high number. Anyway, uh, does, has anybody been fired at Southwest, it's now weeks. So I was told, Dennis, wait and see. They're not going to do it immediately. Has anybody? It's run by a board of directors. Is that correct? There is a board that uh, essentially every corporation, exactly. Has anybody on the board resigned or or been removed? Has any uh, CEO, any official of Southwest been? Uh, uh, Among the sad effects of, uh, of... the, the modern time in which we live is that people who are not blameworthy are blamed, like the teacher at uh, Hamlin College in, uh, in Minnesota who showed a 14th century painting of Muhammad made by Muslims, made by Muslims, honored by Muslims, venerated by Muslims. But one Muslim student, a radicalized Islamist girl, said she was deeply offended by it, even though she was warned, I am going to show, this is an art class, and this is one of the great artworks of the early Middle Ages. It didn't matter. Teacher was fired. So they blame the non-blameworthy, and the blameworthy get away with what they have done. How many many, uh, flights have to be canceled under Pete Buttigieg uh, for there to be a, a... uh, a, a, a clamor to get rid of him. There, it won't happen. There, I, I, I do not believe that there is any number of Americans 
that can have their flights canceled, and Pete Buttigieg would be uh, fired. And nobody at Southwest is fired. You're fired if you show a, a great work of art that f- shows Muhammad. You're fired like at Levi's, Levi's jeans, the woman I had on. She was fired because she said that schools should open up for students. The person herself, a woman of the left, a big supporter of Elizabeth Warren. You get fired for ideas in America, not incompetence. I'd like to introduce you to Monorail, America's investment app that takes you from where you are to where you want to be. Monorail is an investment and savings app that is made for patriots by patriots. Doesn't matter whether you're an Apple fan or if you prefer Android, Monorail is available in both environments and online at monorail.com. Monorail is safer for users with bank-level encryption and biometrics. Your money is protected with Monorail through Securities Investor Protection Corporation and the FDIC. No matter how you engage with Monorail, you're getting the security and safety that you need. Whether you're adding funds to your investment account, looking to buy a stock, or putting money aside for future purchases. With Monorail, you can put your money where it matters and utilize the economic power that built this country. Don't go somewhere else to trade stocks. Monorail gives you the freedom to purchase whole or fractional shares in companies you believe in. It only takes five minutes to download the app and set up. Join the pro-America money movement. Join Monorail. Hi, everybody. I think I know the left really well, but I am now about to speak to someone who knows it at least as well as I do. I don't know anybody else I could say that of other than David Horowitz, who has been a sort of prophet uh, in our lifetime. I'll never forget, uh, David Horowitz, when you said, oh, it must have been in the 90s, that, uh, you, I, I don't know if you coined the term, but it's from you that I heard it, watermelon, green on the outside and red on the inside about the environmentalist movement. Did you coin that term? I don't, I don't think I coined it when I may have, I may have told you that in the 90s. I yeah. don't know where it comes from. All right. Well, anyway, I heard it from you, and it it turned out to be entirely accurate. David Horowitz's uh, new book is Final Battle. The next election could be the last. So that's that's quite a statement. And and the, the picture on the cover shows the stars and stripes without stars, but with a hammer and sickle where the stars should be. So obviously people will say, is David Horowitz overstating the danger? Why don't you respond to that? (laughs) Look, there's a funny thing going on outside the circles that listen to Dennis Prager uh, and others like us. uh, To treat what's happening as normal, it's like it's just a little more a little more corruption and a little more of this. But the first the first perception you have to have is that the Democrat Party and starting with its leadership is a criminal organization. The worst thing that's been done to America, the greatest crime committed against America in its history, is the destruction of our borders and the influx of millions upon millions of people we have no idea who they are. Um, We know that that includes hundreds of thousands of criminals. Uh, And there's nobody in the Democratic Party that's protesting this. Biden knew when he destroyed the border that what he was doing was unconstitutional and illegal. And he knows it because it was a matter of discussion in the Obama administration. Well, Obama went on television, actually, 20 times to explain to his, to his radicals on the left of him that he couldn't uh, alter the immigration laws because he didn't have the constitutional authority to do that. He is Biden and Obama, the executive, they're there to enforce the law not to make it. 
So when you have uh, and the the statistics, we know we know how dangerous this is because uh, the government accounting office in 2018 did a study of illegal so-called migrants um, in the American prisons. And at that time, it was like a tenth of the influx that there is today, thanks to Biden and the Democrats. How many? 730,000 illegal migrants were in American prisons and jails. They had committed seven and a half million crimes, a million drug where, where is this data? Where is this data from? Well, actually, it, it's in, in my book on page 70. It's the general, the government accounting office. A million drug crimes, 500,000 assaults, 133,000 sexual assaults, 51,000 kidnappings, uh, 1,500 terrorist attacks. That's the future that the Democrat Party is prepared for our country. But the, the, the main thing is they're radicals. And I, I did a lot of thinking when I left the left of what it means to be a radical. And, and what I realized was you're a committed criminal if you're a radical. If you believe in the Constitution and the laws of the land, then there are ways to change things that you don't like. But if you want to overthrow the whole system, you are, your mentality is that of a criminal. And that's why they call the Constitution white supremacist. It doesn't even have the words white and black or male and female in its text. They, they call it white, and we have a Supreme Court justice who buys this, uh, Katanji Jackson. Um, they call it white supremacists because they don't believe in the Constitution and the laws of the land. That makes them criminals. It's the mentality. David, I want to ask you, because uh, you, you think of the, the big macro issues. By the way, the, the data you just gave is mind-blowing. I have the book in front of me. I checked it. It's actually, you got it from The Hill, which is not a conservative source. But I, I uh, what I want to ask you is, what do you think the reason for destroying the border to enable millions upon millions of people to come in illegally. What do you think well, the reason is? Leftists, you know, they have defective psychologies. They think everybody's the same. They don't think there are bad seeds. They don't think that, that there are habitual or incorrigible criminals. They don't believe in evil. The left. Uh, the, their attitude uh, is one they hate America as it is of any sane person so you know not subject to an ideological delusion can see that America is the best place to live in the world uh, which is why you have all these people trying to get here all these minorities you know, American blacks, for example, are the richest, uh, freest, most privileged black community in the world, including all of black Africa and the Caribbean. This is a wonderful system that we have, but the left considers it an evil system. And that, therefore, they're willing to do anything. If you... If, when I say they hate America, people... All right, you know, yes, I want you to develop that. We're going to come back in a moment. I want people to get your book, Final Battle. It is up at DennisPrager.com. 
the inimitable David Horowitz. There's a lot of talk about the Great Reset and digital currencies. The U.S. government has been floating the idea of a digital dollar for quite some time, opening up the door to the government controlling your bank account, or worse yet, freezing your money. They did that in Canada, remember? This is Dennis Prager for AmFed, Coin, and Bullion, and for my friend Nick Grovich. Now more than ever in this woke world, it's important to own tangible assets like gold and silver. Owning physical gold and silver gives you control over your wealth. They're proven, stable commodities that have held their value over time. Beyond the overarching reach of government, and it's so important you do business with a trustworthy and transparent company like AmFed Coin and Bullion, AmFed's owner Nick and his experienced team will always provide you with honest, sound advice. No pressure sales. Moving a portion of your wealth into precious metals is a prudent decision. Call AmFed Coin and Bullion. 800-221-7694. AmericanFederal.com. AmericanFederal.com. Hi, everybody. Dennis Prager here. I'm speaking with a great man. I don't use the term often. David Horowitz, his latest book is Final Battle. The next election could be the last is the subtitle. It is up at DennisPrager.com. It's short and, I would say, sweet. Short and certainly readable. Uh, I just, uh, I, I, I want to go back to something, David, in your book. Since you told me what page, I have it right here. The GAO study, that's Government Accounting Office, found that between 2011 and 2016, there were more than 730,000 aliens in the United States or state prisons and local jails, accounting for 4.9 million arrests for 7.5 million offenses. Uh, so, yeah, multiple offenses. The, the, New York, the New York Times regularly tells us that the rate of criminality among uh, illegal immigrants is actually lower than it is for native-born Americans. Are they lying? Uh, no. The New York Times told us there was no famine in the Ukraine caused by the communists. It's, gonna, it's a rag. I mean, you can't, there are some decent reporters on the Times, but you can't take anything that they say seriously. I, these are government statistics. I didn't make them up. No, I, I, I know. It's just it's so important because so many people believe the New York Times. So you were talking about this illegal immigration. I asked you what the end point is or what is in their minds. You had a very interesting answer, and that is that they think everybody is the same. They, they don't understand they really are uh, a, a bad people. But e- well, even, even it, it, forgive me, I just want to say, even if they were all good people, the, the, it, it's not the, the only issue that I, I think that they, they care about. What do you think of the idea that they simply want more voters? Well, I think that's true, but but the, the American system works if that's all you want. If you want to change the world, I have a chapter called Reimagining the World about the, the Green Movement. Um, they celebrated all the lockdowns and the, hard, and the economic hardships of the pandemic because it helped the environment. I mean, you know, at some level, this is crazy. They're delusional because they have this ideology which they think they can create, new, well, this whole transgender movement, we can create new human beings. Um, but at the same time, they're attacking every institution of morality in our country. Uh, you know, I, I go to the uh, January 6th event. Uh, of course, Trump, in advance of January 6th, offered to put 10,000 National Guardsmen around the Capitol because anybody with half a brain knows that on both sides there are fringes we just can't wait to commit violence. It was rejected by Nancy Pelosi and the Democrats. Uh, the demonstration that took place was actually milder than any of the insurrectionary acts by Black Lives Matter. 
He burned the church of the president. The president's burned the gatehouse of the White House. Um, uh, set, set fire to police stations and federal buildings all summer of 2020. But the, what did the Democrats, what was their response to this mild protest that destroyed nothing? It was an armed insurrection. Within days, it was revealed that there were no arms in the, in the, the demonstration. No, no arms confiscated. Um, so the Democrats just dropped the term armed and called it an insurrection without explaining how you can have an insurrection without arms. You obviously can't. Um, then they lied and said five Capitol Police officers were killed. The actual number of police officers killed is zero. There was one person killed, Ashley Babbitt. She was murdered in cold blood and it was caught on tape. She's standing there unarmed, bothering nobody. And this uh, Capitol Police officer just blows her away. Uh, Nancy Pelosi hid his identity. His name is Michael Byrd. He has a history of misuse of Yes. Guns. All right. Hold it there. This is... I, I hope everybody is memorizing what he's saying. They dropped the word armed. Isn't that intelligent? The final battle was uh, the book. David Horowitz. <laughs> the inimitable, truly, David Horowitz is uh, talking with me, and we're talking about the the left and the Democrats. His book is called Final Battle. The next election could be the last, is the subtitle. So long ago, David Horowitz, I mean long ago, I'm, uh, I would say at least 30 years ago, and I, uh, that I know of, and I'm sure he did it earlier than that. He, he understood, as indeed I, I have understood, but I think he, he understood it even better. He, a, he precedes me, but B, because... He grew up in a communist home, but he understands better than virtually anyone that left and communist, the only difference is opportunity. Is that a fair statement, David? Yeah, I think that he is operating like a communist party. No dissent. You know, it's, they get their marching orders from Pelosi. I was going to say, Pelosi not only hid the identity of the murderer, but she quashed the investigations and basically the free, free man. That makes Nancy Pelosi an accomplice to murder. You're talking about the, Ashley Babbitt. I just want everybody to understand. The, the murder of Ashley Babbitt. And they, and they had this charade to maintain their, their idea that this, there was a, a violent crowd that attacked police officers. They, said, they claim that uh, Brian Sucknick, who happened to be actually a Trump supporter, uh, was, was killed by the mob when he actually died a day after Jan on January 7th in his bed from natural causes. They held a special uh, ceremony of him lying in state in the Capitol, a rare privilege, uh, as a martyr to the people. I, actually, he's, he's a boy. They all went along with this charade. You have to ask yourself, what kind of mentality is that? Well, if you think you're saving the world, uh, the planet, um, it'll justify anything. If you're that delusional, I mean, we can't, you know, the Mississippi overflows every year and floods homes, kills people. We can't even control one river. How can you control the, the planetary climate? It's just absurd. But once you're inside that bubble and everybody around you is feeding your illusions, you're, you're, the nobler the dream 
the, the greater the world that you think you can create, the more crimes you will either commit or sanction or support, the more lies you will tell. Uh, and they, they have no sense of reality. Because when they get control of any media, like they, they have most of our media, and of course the university system, and I, I have to say that if I'm in awe of what you have done with PragerU, uh, because the university system is, you know, the, in, in Germany, the universities were the first institutions to go over to the Nazis. And... Uh, that's what we have in America today. You can't get an education in college. It's just terrible. Uh, but, uh, yeah. you know, good things are happening. Prager U, Trump has created the first mass conservative movement in our history with his rallies. Uh, and then there's this spontaneous development. I mean, the, the assault on children. You know, what... I used to consider myself a Marxist revolutionary. I would have been horrified at these attacks on little children, hmm. uh, castrating them. Well, to, I mean, it's just unbelievable what the left will accept. But when, once you're inside that bubble, you can believe almost anything. A big breakthrough that I had was that my, my parents, for some reason, got a book by Isaac Deutscher, who was a Trotskyite, but an anti-Stalinist. And that, that I, I, before that, I would only read, and uh, I was typical in this, books that reflected our ideology. Uh, and Deutscher, of course, was being a, a Trotskyite, was anti-Stalin. And that opened a whole new world for me. But I, these people, they, they, you know, they defame you. They call you th those names. Have a, uh, That's all they do. I always they, note that he called, uh, Stalin called Trotsky a fascist. David, I want, I want to promote your book. Uh, folks, it's so important to read this. Anything David Horowitz has written. I, I mean, I loved his autobiography, which he wrote many years ago. Final battle. The book is up. God bless you. You are a gift to freedom, David Horowitz. My Pillow is excited to bring you their biggest bedding sale ever and just in time for Christmas. For a limited time, get the Giza Dream bed sheets for as low as $29.98, a set of pillowcases for only $9.98, and rejuvenate your bed with a My Pillow mattress topper for as low as $99.99. They also have blankets in a variety of sizes, colors, and styles. They even have blankets for your pets. Get duvets, quilts, down comforters, body pillows, bolster pillows, and so much more, all with the biggest discounts of the year happening now. They're also extending their money-back guarantee for Christmas until March 1st, 2023, making them the perfect gifts for your friends, your family, and everyone you know. So go to MyPillow.com and use the promo code PRAGER or call 800-761-6302. You'll get huge discounts on all my pillow bedding products, including the Giza Dream bed sheets for as low as twenty nine ninety eight, and get all your shopping done now while quantities last. And hello, all. Dennis Prager here. I'll be broadcasting from Florida tomorrow because tomorrow is the first session of eight sessions. On the book of Exodus with Jordan Peterson and five of us in addition to Jordan Peterson. The first half is already up at Daily Wire and I'll be there for nine days in Miami and I will be broadcasting from there and then I do the sessions with the wonderful people that he brings in. Am I honored to be among them? again as I was. So that's my schedule. Julie Hartman will be sitting in for me this final hour of the show after this hour. That is the third hour. Julie and I do a podcast together called Dennis and Julie. We have about 44, I think, segments up. I am transparent, or I aim to be transparent, 
on my radio show. For, for, I have tried that for 40 years. But I, I have to acknowledge that I am even more open about my life and thoughts because of the dialogues with Julie on the Dennis and Julie podcast. You can see it on YouTube. You can listen to it anywhere you listen to podcasts, including Salem. She has her own show, by the way, daily, called Timeless. It is, I cannot overstate my enthusiasm about this young woman. I thank God that we found her. Actually, she came searching for me. She was a liberal, never a leftist, but a liberal at Harvard. I came across my writings, and then Prager U, and then the radio, and the rest is history. I believe that if every young person were exposed to people like me for any period of time, even just a couple of months, I believe that about 40% of them would reject leftism. I may be understating it, I may be overstating it. I don't think I'm overstating it, but I don't know if I'm understating it. Clearly, not everybody is prepared to hear, and I mean hear, not just hear the words, but hear the message. Because people are very loath to leave their comfort zones. However, even if I'm right about 40%, which is under half, obviously, that is why it is so important for you to expose young people to these ideas. They never get them at the elementary school, high school, or college they are attending. Maybe never is too strong because there's no such thing as never, almost never. How's that? Here's an example from Yale. I I tend to think that Yale is the most loathsome of the Ivy League universities, is the most anti-thought, anti-intellectual, anti-moral, anti-American. And then, of course, you, you see data like Columbia University was voted the most suppressing of speech in America. The college I attended, actually, in, in graduate school. And then you look at the University of Pennsylvania, another Ivy League college, and what what they do, like removing Shakespeare's mural from the Department of English because he was white and male. You, do you understand the primitiveness? You know the 250 law professors at the University of Pennsylvania Law School signed a petition to not have a fellow professor teach the introductory course for law students because she said that middle class values were the best values and she specified what they were graduate high school get a job get married and then have children she was condemned as a white supremacist leftists don't realize the compliment that they pay to white people if those are white values then that's really remarkable about how how remarkably good whites have been in formulating values. Are those really white values? White values? Is there such a thing? Hitler was white. Stalin was white. What makes those values white? There's no such thing as white values. There's such thing as values. There are universal values that whites, blacks, and everybody else should either adopt or not adopt. Your color is not what makes values values. What's black values? If those are white values, what are black values? 
Don't graduate high school. Don't get a job. Don't get married before you have children. Are those black values? If they say that those values, and they do, are white values, the the obvious inference to be drawn is the contempt that the left has for non-whites, which is true. The only systemic racism is on the left. They truly have contempt for blacks. That's why they lower standards for blacks. Conservatives do not have a low view of blacks, so they don't want to lower standards for blacks, let alone call the best value system white. Yale Divinity School, what a joke, Divinity School. They, the left destroys everything it touches. Divinity schools are one of the examples. Yale Divinity School launches social justice center with progressive minister at helm. Yale Divinity School will launch a new theology center in the coming months that aims to advance social justice and battle systemic inequality. It's from the College Fix. It will be led by Bishop William Barber II, a prominent progressive Christian minister known for his, quote, moral movement, anti-poverty advocacy. Barber helps lead the Poor People's Campaign, for example, which challenges, are you ready? This is the man who will head this new department at the Yale Divinity School. He leads the campaign which challenges, in his words, the interlocking, you already know it's leftist, interlocking is a left-wing term, evils of systemic racism, poverty, ecological devastation, militarism, and the war economy, and the distorted moral narrative of religious nationalism. Well... And he's a, uh, he's a Christian minister. He will lead at Yale what is being called the Center for Public Theology and Public Policy. It is being created to instruct the next generation of theologians, lawyers, and activists on how to engage with America's current social issues relating to systemic inequality. To achieve this, the Center, quote, will pursue teaching, practice, research, and collaboration at the intersection of theology and advocacy. The center will also organize regular meetings and a, quote, biennial training summit that brings together scholars, interfaith religious leaders, economists, activists, lawyers, students, and community members. Yale's role in destroying America is, I'm a, I'm thinking unparalleled, and it might be unparalleled. Yale is a cesspool, period. Its president has done more harm than almost any living American to American education and therefore to America. And as I point out in my article this week, he sleeps well, his conscience tells him he's doing good. That's why if you answer to your conscience, it means nothing. People who do the most harm answer to their conscience. Every communist and Nazi Nazi answered to his conscience. And the conscience said, good job, fella. Back in a moment. COVIDtaxrelief.org got a small retail business almost $80,000. COVIDtaxrelief.org got a manufacturing business nearly $250,000. And COVIDtaxrelief.org just got a large distribution business almost $900,000. If you run a business, church, or nonprofit and paid your employees through all or part of the pandemic, you could qualify for up to $26,000 per employee through the government's CARES Act. But beware of clickbait or pay-up-front companies 
that make you do the work and take a huge percentage of your refund. COVIDtaxrelief.org receives a low, reasonable commission only after you receive your refund. And with 300 CPAs and tax experts, no one is better at getting you the maximum benefit than COVIDtaxrelief.org. Visit COVIDtaxrelief.org now because this plan expires soon. That's COVIDtaxrelief.org, COVIDtaxrelief.org. Refund examples are not a guarantee and not all businesses qualify. Tell you I lie. I lie. I know that it can be challenging to keep up with the onslaught against America from within and from without. But I always think of it as in this in this way. I'm not asked to storm Normandy Beach. When we have asked Americans to risk their lives, risk their their limbs, and they have responded, the least I could do is risk my peace. I mean, that's really what it is about. Because it's, it's upsetting to know what the left is doing to this country. But you can't take the easy way out and tune out. That's just morally wrong. This Yale story is really troubling. And I have a, I have a statement to make about the people at Yale Divinity School, and specifically the man who will lead this uh, left-wing, society-destroying center that they're, what are they calling it? What is the new name? The Center for Public Theology and Public Policy. What does public theology mean? Is there any non-public theology? Okay, Bishop William Barber II, this leftist Christian minister. So I explain in my Bible commentary, the Rational Bible, I explain the Third Commandment. Do not take the Lord's name in vain. It has been misunderstood by most uh, people, Jews and Christians, for centuries especially people who think that it means that if you say the the word God and it's not in a religious context, you are violating the third commandment. It is impossible that that's what the third commandment means. Impossible. And I will explain why. Because the rest of the commandment says, because God will not forgive who take, whoever takes his name in vain. So either God is morally confused or we don't understand and we're morally confused and the answer is always we're morally confused God will not will not forgive a person who says oh my god what a tough day at the office oh my god did you see that touchdown it's God will will so in other words God will Forgive murder and all the other prohibitions of the last five, but he but he won't forgive saying, oh my God, no. So I explain it because of the Hebrew. The Hebrew is do not, do not carry. It is literally do not carry. The word is used, tisa, for those of you who know Hebrew, it is used elsewhere in the Bible and it also means, and it does mean, to carry. That's what it actually does mean. Who carries God's name in vain? People who do bad in God's name. That's the thing that God won't forgive, because that's the worst sin you can commit according to the Ten Commandments. It is really bad anyone who commits evil. But if you commit evil, let's say murder, But if you commit evil in God's name, you are the worst. You're worse than an atheist evildoer. And I would put these left-wing, radical, 
quasi-communist people like this guy at Yale in the category of taking God's name in vain. They're screwing around with the Bible on behalf of leftism. Their religion is leftism. Their rhetoric is Christianity. That's the lowest of the low. And that is what Yale is fostering with millions of dollars. The damage flowing from the universities is not new, as was just stated by David Horowitz uh, to me last hour. The universities were the first to welcome the Nazis in Germany, and universities in the West were the breeding grounds for pro-communist activity. The people who gave Stalin the the greatest mass murderer in the history of the world, second only to Mao, the people who gave him the secrets to the atom bomb were intellectuals. Life's a battle. You would think America had created such a relatively, everything is relative, such a relatively decent place. People would thank God or thank their lucky stars that they were living here. But as I've so often pointed out, secularism plus affluence produces boredom. Boredom produces a seeking of some substitute for religion because people cannot live without religion. Leftism is a religion, but it's a secular religion. What they're doing at Yale is confusing secular religion with Judeo-Christian religions. That's bad stuff. So, So they have found confidential documents uh, in Joe Biden's garage now. The most interesting... Classified. Classified. classified, What did I say? Confidential. Yeah, classified. I'm sorry. That's right. Classified. The most interesting aspect of it is the yawn with which the left greets it. Tucker Carlson has played some of the comments on finding some classified documents in Mar-a-Lago. America is being threatened by Donald Trump. Our security. Their mum now. Hello, everybody. I'm Dennis Prager. <clears throat> there we go. All good. Well, not all good in, in the world. All good here in the studio. Brent in Los Angeles, California is calling to say there's only one race, the human race. Do you know that that statement, there is only one race, the human race, is on the list of microaggression racist comments of the University of California? You are a racist if you say there's only one race. Do you understand that lying is central to leftism and has always been from Vladimir Lenin and Pravda to today and the mainstream media? Isn't it an out-and-out lie that the statement there is only one race, the human race, is racist? Isn't that pure lie? Isn't it the opposite of truth? It's not, it's not even a little lie. It's a complete lie. And yet, I would say half of the young people of America believe that if you say there is only one race, the human race, you are a racist. That's what they're taught at college, at 95% of the colleges of the United States. It's a very serious problem. I've come up with an idea, incidentally, that I'm going to raise at at, uh, at length. In other words, maybe devote an hour to it. I have a suggestion for you, for your for your son or daughter. This is totally serious suggestion, and. You will thank me 
years uh, in the years to come if you actually take my suggestion and act on it. So your son or daughter has just graduated high school or graduated college or, for that matter, is in the midst of it. But sometime between high school graduation and college graduation, you should tell your son or daughter that you will not pay for the college that year, but you will pay to support your son or daughter if he or she becomes a waiter or waitress for six months, ideally the year. And here's the the kicker, as it were. Not in Chicago or New York City or L.A., but in the Midwest. Pick a city. Where will it be? Omaha, Nebraska. Lincoln, Nebraska. Des Moines, Iowa. Anywhere to get away. I mean, there are leftists in every state and every city. But to get away from the bubble that Boston, New York, San Francisco are, for example. If your son or daughter is a waiter or waitress for a year, and again, you you are you have the right to say this. It's easier done right after graduation. They may not want to leave their friends uh, at college, and I, I understand that. That's why you should do it right after uh, high school or upon graduation. I, uh, I think it would be great in the middle of college, too. It doesn't matter. The more that a young person is forced to confront reality, the less likely they are to be a leftist. Leftism is a rejection of reality as it is. You can't reject reality more obviously than denying there are two sexes. They live in a make-believe, vile world on the left. They make up the world. There's only one race. The human race is racist, is making it up, is making up a new reality. You can't, you can't be colorblind. In other words, the ideal that your color doesn't mean a damn thing, which is the ideal. Your color means nothing because we know nothing about you if we know your color. Tell me one thing we know about you if we know you're black. Tell me one thing we know. Do we know your character? Do we know your passions? Do we know your family life? Do we know your intellectual level? Do we know your moral level? Do we know anything about you? Do we know what food you like? We know nothing about you if we know you're black or white or brown or red. Correct? Then why is it important? Because the left said so. That's it. That's it. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to The Dennis Prager Show. It is the third hour of the program. And those of you who are listening to the last segment of the second hour know that I am Julie Hartman, and I am sitting in for Dennis on this third hour because he had to skedaddle. He is actually flying to Florida for 10 days to record a second round of interviews for the Daily Wire's Exodus series with Jordan Peterson. So... It is for good reason that I am sitting in, and I am certainly honored to do so. I'd like to remind you that our call-in number is 18Prager776. Please call in on any subject that I talk about, especially if you disagree with me, because I am going to prioritize those phone calls. We have breaking news here at the top of the hour. Just minutes ago, Attorney General Merrick Garland has announced that he is appointing former United States Attorney from Maryland Robert Herr as special counsel to oversee the investigation of classified documents found at President Biden's former personal office at a Washington think tank. This is big news. 
We know that Merrick Garland, back in November, appointed Jack Smith to serve as special counsel to investigate Trump's possessions of classified documents that were found during the infamous FBI raid on Mar-a-Lago. And of course, it was announced earlier this week that President Biden's personal lawyers back in November, days before the midterm election, found a stash of about 10 classified documents featuring intelligence on Iran and Ukraine in a closet of Biden's former office at this think tank. And then last night, according to NBC News, we know that a second trove of classified documents has been found. Again, we don't know where these second uh, trove of documents were found. We don't know about the material or the character of the documents, whether they, uh, you know, contain foreign intelligence or domestic intelligence. But nevertheless, we do know that there is another trove and that this second trove was also discovered back in November. So the obvious question is, if this were discovered back in November, why are we only hearing about it now? So the media has been reporting on this uh, Biden uh, document scandal. Uh, They've been reporting on it quite a bit. I have to say, I I was originally shocked because I was flipping through the news channels and seeing CNN and and MSNBC covering it uh, for hours on end. And now Merrick Garland has come out and said that he is appointing a special counsel. But what I would like to say to you, dear friends, is do not fall for it. In my view, what the media is trying to do and what Merrick Garland is trying to do is throw the right a bone. Throw the American people a bone and say, hey, look, we're impartial. Yeah, we went after President Trump over having classified documents. but We're going to go after President Biden for having classified documents, too. Because unfortunately, on the scale of offenses, the scale of Biden offenses, I should say, this is relatively minor. I am not trying to certainly brush this aside. It is a huge deal that he has classified documents, and it is an even bigger deal considering the way that he admonished Trump. But what I'm trying to point out to you here is that the, new, the, the legacy media is just trying to report on this constantly to seem like they are impartial. And we do not have any reason to believe, according to Merrick Garland's record, that he is going to have this special counsel that is in charge of the Biden documents be uh, impartial and really follow the law. Because if you look at the way that Merrick Garland treats conservatives versus liberals, it's not even close. Late last year, for instance, Merrick Garland's DOJ went after several pro-lifers For the grave offense of praying in front of an abortion clinic, they arrested 11 nonviolent, peaceful pro-life activists on the bogus charges relating to the federal freedom of access to clinic entrances law. And two of these people, their names are Mark Houck and Chester Gallagher, actually had had FBI agents raid their home. 30 heavily armed individuals knocked on these two men's doors and with guns drawn while their families were home and came in and arrested them. So seeing the way that Merrick Garland and his DOJ goes after conservatives indicates the level of hostility that he has towards us. And so the fact that he's appointing the special counsel for Biden really doesn't amount to anything. They're, they're, it doesn't seem that, that he is really going to go after Biden in the way that he should. Now, as bad as this document frenzy is, there is another story that emerged this week about President Biden that I would argue is just as, if not more, important and damning. And this document frenzy is overshadowing this story. So I want to tell you what it is. Last year, the attorney generals of Missouri and Louisiana filed a joint lawsuit against the Biden administration, alleging that the White House worked with social media companies to censor political content and specifically to censor anti-COVID vaccine content that the administration did not like. And so just a few days ago, there have been public documents released as a result of this case, which is called Missouri versus Biden. And these documents reveal that it is in fact true. 
that members of the Biden White House were harassing Facebook and YouTube to censor conservative content. Now, we, we know that this isn't exactly a new phenomenon. We can see from the Twitter files that there has been a huge ha- apparatus on behalf of our government to work alongside big tech companies to suppress conservative content. But it's pretty stunning now that there is confirmation that Biden White House, of, White House officials, excuse me, did this specifically with Facebook. So let's look at some of these emails and some of the facts. Rob Flaherty is the Biden White House's director of digital media. And in exchanges that were released over the past few days, it shows that he was emailing Facebook executives all throughout 2021, trying to get them to remove the accounts of those who expressed skepticism about the COVID vaccine. So in March of 2021, Mr. Flaherty emailed a Facebook exec saying, quote, We are gravely concerned that your service is one of the top drivers of vaccine hesitancy, period. We want to know that you are not playing a shell game. He also wrote in another email to a Facebook exec that Facebook has directed attention to COVID skeptics and anti-vaccine trusted messengers and that it is promoting anti-vaccine pages in its search. What is wrong with that? If Facebook is supposed to be an open forum for free speech, what is so wrong about doing that? Well, the Facebook executive, again, according to these documents in Missouri versus Biden, dutifully replied and said that they have pledged to, quote, remove vaccine information and reduce the virality of content discouraging vaccines that does not contain actionable misinformation. This is big. Because this executive is admitting in this email chain, and I'm about to quote here, that some of this uh, vaccine hesitancy, some of these posts that are expressing skepticism about the COVID vaccine are, quote, often true, according to the Facebook executive. But nevertheless, because, nevertheless, excuse me, because they are alarmist or shocking, Facebook has pledged, quote, that they will remove these groups disproportionately promoting this sensationalized content. And Mr. Flaherty, the Biden White House director of digital communications, replied, thank you. So we are seeing direct coordination here between the Biden White House and Facebook to suppress true content about the COVID vaccines, just because it does not align with the Biden's political positions. In these email chains, Mr. Flaherty also demanded that Facebook, quote, limit the spread of viral content on WhatsApp, which I guess Facebook owns or or has uh, control over. And this is because WhatsApp, quote, has great reach in immigrant communities and communities of color. So Mr. Flaherty wants to prevent the spread of COVID vaccine hesitancy among these groups. He also wrote to a Facebook exec blaming Facebook for the January 6th 6th attack, excuse me, on the Capitol. And he pressured Facebook to, quote, deploy an algorithmic shift to promote quality news and information about the election. Now, who is deciding what constitutes quality news about the election? Is it an impartial group of fact checkers or is it this guy, Mr. Flaherty, who is breathing down the necks of Facebook executives? And finally, another thing that was revealed in these new documents is that Flaherty wrote to Facebook flagging a Tucker Carlson episode for which Tucker Carlson said uh, expressed skepticism about the vaccine. Facebook replied that they were taking it down and Flaherty flagged the accounts of several private citizens, and the Facebook exec responded, both of these accounts that you have flagged have been removed from Instagram entirely for breaking our policy. This is just as important, if not more important, than the whole document frenzy that we are seeing now. And we need this to be better reported on, because what the media is doing is that they are using the document frenzy to distract you so that more people are not reporting on this. Julie Hartman here, sitting in for Dennis in the third hour of the Dennis Prager Show. I was just telling you about a Biden story, a Biden scandal, that is not pertaining to classified documents, though that, of course, is a scandal worth talking about, but instead 
pertaining to emails that were released as a part of an investigation into the Biden White House's coordination with Facebook to censor conservative content. We have found out that Rob Flaherty, who is the senior director of digital communications at the Biden White House, all throughout the year of 2021, was harassing and pressuring Facebook to remove uh, accounts and posts that expressed skepticism about the COVID vaccines. And Facebook, unsurprisingly, dutifully capitulated. So... This makes it all the more ironic that this morning in the Wall Street Journal, President Biden is featured as the main editorial contributor. And guess what he's writing about? Big tech abuses. He writes, I urge Democrats and Republicans to come together to pass strong bipartisan legislation to hold big tech accountable. He said he is concerned about how some in the industry collect, share, and exploit our most personal data, deepen extremism and polarization in our country, tilt our economy's playing field, violate the civil rights of women and minorities. That's kind of a head scratcher, but, you know, he always has to throw that in there and even put our children at risk. So I just have to highlight this one paragraph for you that he said because it is so ironic and so blatantly hypocritical. He writes, we need big tech companies to take responsibility for the content they spread and the algorithms they use. Oh, really, Mr. Biden? Meanwhile, your senior officials are communicating with big tech to try to control these algorithms and content. As my dear friend Dennis Prager would say, he lies with the ease with which we breathe. Moving on to international news, we're going to talk about the Vatican for a moment. The Vatican obviously has been in the news a lot over the past few weeks because of the death of Pope Benedict, who died on the last day of 2022, December 31st, and his funeral was held on January 5th. But I want to highlight another story that the Pope's death, or the Pope Emeritus's death, excuse me, I should say, has overshadowed. And that is the Vatican is increasingly calling on Catholic institutions and Catholic believers around the world to pursue what's called faith consistent investing. Now, I said at the end of the second hour when Dennis and I were speaking, I call this CESG, Catholic ESG. I'm reading here from an article in the Wall Street Journal. Pope Francis, as well as the USCCB, which is the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, have set guidelines urging Catholics to, quote, avoid investing their money in companies that produce violent video games and drugs that induce abortion. Other industries on the blacklist include makers of armaments, pornography, and genetically modified seeds. Hmm. Doesn't this seem like quite a hodgepodge to you? We have violent video games, drugs that induce abortion, armaments, and then seeds. It just seems like an odd and inconsistent and incomplete list. For instance, why is the Vatican limiting it to just violent video games? If violent content is harmful and something that we should move away from, why not encourage people to stop investing in violent TV shows? or violent movies, violent books or graphic novels, or violent virtual reality headset worlds? Why why are you just talking about video games? Or similarly, when they talk about drugs uh, that induce abortion, what about barring companies that give money to Planned Parenthood? Or what about people who support Merrick Garland going after the pro-lifers for uh, praying in front of an abortion clinic? Again, it, it just seems a bit odd and incomplete. And even worse, as part of this CESG, again, this is a a coin, a a coin that I have termed, a term that I have coined to talk about uh, Pope Francis and the Vatican's new uh, faith conscious investing. Even worse is their environmental push. The Pope has called on believers to stop investing in companies that produce fossil fuels. Yes, this is coming from the Pope. And the USCCB, which again is that United States Conference of Cardinals, has said that you, quote, should invest in companies whose business models are consistent with the emission reduction goals of the Paris Climate Agreement. Oh boy. The Catholic Church should know better 
than just about any institution about how much fossil fuels have benefited civilization and specifically benefited poor people. Through the heat and internal combustion engine, it has allowed so many people to heat their homes who otherwise would not have been able to. And hey, you know, also, doesn't the Vatican use fossil fuels? Last time I checked, I haven't seen a uh, solar panel on the top of the Sistine Chapel, have you? Don't Catholic churches and monasteries and convents and schools use fossil fuels? It's so sad to see the papacy, which is supposed to be this beacon of morality, succumb to this phenomenon of talking about things when they don't live by those same things. If the Catholic Church would like people to stop investing in fossil fuels, then they should lead by example. They should retrofit, as I said, their schools, their monasteries, their churches, their convents with solar panels. And what this reflects, unfortunately, and I've been thinking about this so much with the death of Pope Benedict, is that we have weak defenders right now of Western civilization. It appears that the Pope is picking these scattered postage stamp sized problems to talk about. But the real problem here is the corrosive wokeism and the anti-Western civilization ideas that have creeped into Europe and the Northern Hemisphere. What the Pope should be doing, instead of talking about violent video games or seeds, he should be saying, you know what? We have to stand up to this corrosive wokeism. He should be calling out Canada for their lackadaisical medically assisted suicide laws. He should be calling out the United States and the Democrats for their mutilation of children. He should be, he should be calling out the suppression of free speech in the United States, in Canada, and in places like Norway, where a woman was just thrown in jail for saying that a man cannot be a lesbian. That is how the Pope should be using his bully pulpit, not to talk about seeds or video games. And if you just think about the canon of defenders of Western civilization that we just had 40 years ago, we had Pope John Paul II, Pope Benedict, Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher, think about those icons, those world leaders who were out there standing up for Judeo-Christian values. Who do we have now? Pope Francis? President Biden? I don't even, I can't even remember the name of the the new prime minister of of, um, Germany or any of those European countries. There really isn't a figure besides Georgia Maloney publicly right now who is standing up for Western civilization. And what does that say about the state we're in? We'll be back. Julie Hartman had a Joe Biden moment ending that last segment. I said there was a prime minister of Germany. Sean, are you going to keep that one for the archives and relentlessly play it for me so I can cry and remember my mistake? Just a bit outside. <laughs> My friends, I do know that there is not a prime minister of Germany. Actually, can we double check that? I'm almost positive there's not. I know there's a chancellor, and I know the chancellor is Olaf Schultz. What I was trying to say is the prime minister of the UK, who is Rishi Sunak. That is the name that I could not remember. The UK has had a heavy turnover of prime ministers. And our latest one is a conservative. I don't know why I said R, by the way. Do I consider myself a member of the... uh, the uh, UK. No, I don't. Uh, I guess I'm saying R is a, a member of Western civilization. But yes, Rishi Sunak is the new prime minister of Britain. Anyway, what I was trying to say in the last segment is that we used to have these can- this canon of great leaders who were defending Western civilization staunchly. You know, if you look at the triad of the papacy in the United States and Great Britain, You used to have Pope Benedict, Pope John Paul II, Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher, and now we don't have anything close to that. We have Francis, we have Biden, and we have Rishi Sunak, who is sort of a rhino in Great Britain, though he is a conservative. We certainly do have remarkable everyday people. This radio show is a testament to that. We have remarkable but a dwindling number of religious leaders and other figures in civil society. You know, 
Clarence Thomas comes to mind. Ron DeSantis comes to mind. But again, as far as leaders on the world stage, we don't have people out there anymore staunchly defending Western civilization. And this is arguably the, one of the most important times in the past half century to have world leaders defending Western civilization because we see the ascent of China and Russia and specifically and especially China. So we need to focus on bringing back those great leaders. Speaking of the decline of Western civilization, a federal court may overturn the death penalty of the Boston Marathon bomber. It's important to know that in April, it will mark 10 years since the Boston Marathon bombing. This man killed three people and caused 17 to lose limbs. The First Circuit overturned his death sentence in 2020, but it was reimposed, luckily, by the Supreme Court. But now it is being challenged again because the Boston Marathon bomber's attorney is arguing that there was juror misconduct in the case. The attorney says that one of the jurors who voted to declare the Boston Marathon bomber guilty claimed to have not posted about the bomber on social media, but apparently this individual did, calling him online a piece of garbage. The Boston Marathon Bomber's attorney is also citing that another juror claimed that none of his friends or family members were talking to him about the trial. But apparently it has come out that one of the friends of this juror had apparently pushed the juror to, quote, play the part to get on the jury and convict, convict, excuse me, the defendant. The reason why I bring this up as a reason for the decline of Western civilization is, is again, in April, it will be 10 years since this happened. Why hasn't this Boston Marathon bomber been executed? Why are we still litigating this? Should this take 10 years and all of these court resources? Does a healthy society really do that? In my view, and I know that this is a view held by many on the right and has been espoused even by Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas, the punishment has to fit the crime. I am of the belief that if you go out into the street, as we are seeing so many people do in the big cities these days, and you kill someone, obviously you have the right to a trial. But if you kill someone, you need to be executed immediately. That is what a healthy civilization does. As Dennis Prager says, Why is it the case that the people who die get the death penalty, the victims get the death penalty, but then the perpetrator gets the right to live? Doesn't that seem a bit backwards to us? 1-8-Prager-776, call in if you disagree with me. It will be interesting to see whether this is overturned. You know, there's 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 a pretty big chance that he may not get the death penalty because we are seeing so many on the left try to move away from the death penalty because it is supposedly a marker of the carceral state in which we live. Terrible. The field is gone. Hey, everyone. Final segment of the third hour. Julie Hartman here. You can find out more about me at julie-hartman.com. You can also follow me on Instagram at Julie R. Hartman. I am the co-host of the Dennis and Julie podcast, and I have a show of my own called Timeless, which you can watch live in about an hour. Now, I said at the end of the last segment that I'd be talking more about Brazil on Timeless, but I really do just quickly in these final few minutes want to tell you some important facts because the storming of Congress in Brazil has been in the news recently. The pro-Bolsonaro protesters who believe that their election was stolen and want to overthrow the current President Lula of Brazil. There's been a lot of coverage uh, drawing links between this attack in Brazil and January 6th. But I just want to tell you some information that the mainstream media is not reporting on. By the way, in no way am I condemning violence. I'm not taking sides here. I am just trying to point out information to you that I do not see the media telling you, which is important context, and I think that you should know. 
The election that the rioters are protesting is the closest election in Brazilian history, with Lula winning only 51 percent of the vote. There has been evidence of vote buying. The digital voting machines in Brazil do not have a consistent manual to count the votes, which raises speculation about the consistency with which they are counted. The presidential vote in Brazil is also only counted in the span of a few minutes. It doesn't take hours or days, only minutes, which again also raises skepticism. And leading up to the election, the Supreme Electoral Tribunal, which oversees elections and is staffed with Lula uh, supporters, were engaging in free speech suppressions both in newspapers and online on social media against conservatives. And Lula, the current president, the mainstream media does not tell you, is one of the most corrupt leaders throughout Brazilian history. In fact, in 2018, he was imprisoned over charges of corruption and money laundering of Brazilian taxpayer money and government funds. And also, it's important to note that in the 90s, he, alongside Cuban dictator Fidel Castro, founded the San Paulo Forum, which is a radical leftist group that came together after the Soviet Union lost the Cold War to decide what to do next about spreading leftism around the world. And Castro and um, Lula decided through this forum that they would bring Soviet guerrilla groups to Latin America because they thought if they failed in winning the Cold War, then they could succeed at gaining uh, electoral gains in Latin America. So this is part of the group that elected Hugo Chavez, which is that vile Venezuelan dictator, and Danielle Ortega, a similarly vile uh, leader in Nicaragua. So that is just to say, again, while violence is never okay, There may be legitimate reasons why these protesters are raising concerns. And we now know that the Brazilian government has detained 1,500 of them. Uh, We don't know how those individuals are going to be treated. But we need to know all of the facts, not just the facts that are useful to the left that wants to call this another January 6th. Thank you very much for joining me today. I hope that you will watch Timeless in an hour and take care. Dennis Prager here. Thanks for listening to the Daily Dennis Prager Podcast. To hear the entire three hours of my radio show, commercial-free, every single day, become a member of PragerTopia. You'll also get access to 15 years' worth of archives, as well as the daily show prep. Subscribe at PragerTopia.com.